Uh, yeah, thanks for attending a talk which uh, eventually is about scaling Bitcoin uh, from the point of view of a non-technical person. I'm not a software developer or technician. Uh, software developers or technicians don't come up with uh, ideas like a negative block size because they uh, live in the in the real world. Um, and uh, let me stress that we actually have more important issues and problems to solve in Bitcoin. Um, <clears throat> for example, I believe fungibility and privacy are much more pressing issues at the moment than actually the scaling debate is. But unfortunately, the scaling debate is being blown entirely out of proportion. Whoever of you is uh, active in Bitcoin probably know, knows this. And um, yeah, well, I have come to realize uh, in the last one or two years that there is a lot of new people coming into the Bitcoin community, economy and cryptocurrency scene um, who jump at this thing because they see it's a real innovative new technology. Um, the whole blockchain hype in all the um, magazines um, does the rest. I'm, I'm actually getting a bit distracted by people speaking very loudly somewhere, never mind. Um, so what I want to try to do here is um, to get people on board who do actually not have the experience and have not been around long enough um, to understand what this whole thing is actually about, what the motivation of cryptocurrency is and, and where we want it to lead to. Because only if you understand that, um, you can actually make up your mind about Bitcoin. As I said, there's a lot of new people coming in because it's really cool tech and they're like, yeah, but what's the problem if there's a company running this blockchain or if there's a government uh, taking care of the issuance of money and so on. <clears throat> but actually, before I want to start this, uh, talking about that, um, uh, do, do, do any people in the audience uh, know an author called Robert Anton Wilson? Have you read his books? Wow, there's actually two. Um, so Robert Anton Wilson um, is a great, was a great author. Unfortunately, he died about 15 years ago. He wrote books like the Illuminati Trilogy. He wrote The Cosmic Trigger. Um, he was inspiration for generations of hackers. And shortly before his death, I think around the year 2000, he gave an interview to Matthias Bröckers and Bröckers, uh, yeah, and these stories of, of Wilson are like stuffed with the most unbelievable, hilarious conspiracy theories. So uh, Bröckers asked Wilson, um, how did you come up with this stuff? You know, I mean, I mean, I mean, how can one make that kind of conspiracy theories up? And Wilson's answer was that uh, during the 60s and 70s, when he was very active in the American civil liberties and peace movement, at a certain stage, everybody there had realized that every organization is entirely infiltrated by government agents and, and people who wanted to spin um, all the good efforts around and so on. So he was like, we were so desperate. Um, it was horrible because you, to whoever you talked to, you never knew um, from what side he comes from and maybe he's an agent from the other side, another side or whatever. So the only way I, Robert Anton Wilson, uh, was capable of dealing with that situation, not being able to trust anyone anymore, was to write up all these books. Why am I saying that? Um, if you now look around yourself and look into the face of anyone else, maybe a person you do know or do not know on this Congress, just do it right now. Um, look into someone's face. Um, I estimate you have a 1 to 10 chance to just have looked into the face of some intelligence service member. Um, and um, <clears throat> yeah, the, this entirely new space that, that aims at disrupting existing financial and political systems, of course, is also absolutely and entirely flooded with um, propaganda. So I would urge you to not believe anyone a word, and that includes myself, um, 
always in this space try to make up your own mind and, and, and don't follow opinions of other people. And as I said, I include myself. So the, the best thing you can do with this talk is imagine me as an agent of the most evil organization that you can imagine, some bank or government or whatever. And um, yeah, I'm trying to bring this block size topic down um, to a way that allowed me to understand it. As I said, I'm not a, a software developer or technician. I'm a conceptioner, so I need to find metaphors and explain the world to me in a different way than a software developer. Um, <clears throat> so about Bitcoin. Um, in the same interview that I just mentioned with uh, Robert Anton Wilson, um, Brokers asked him, do you think, because they both agreed on the fact that humanity is actually at a crossroad and that our future will be either an entirely dystopian fascist system or a really free, libertarian, peaceful, anarchist system. And that we are at a crossroads and that for the future of humanity there is not, mu not many grey shades in between these two extremes. So Brekkers asked Wilson, do you think we are going to end up in this dystopian fascism or in a peaceful anarchy? And let me just read Wilson's answer. Um, if we make it there, the future will be a peaceful anarchy and not a dystopian fascism, simply because things are getting too complicated for anyone to even understand, not to mention rule everything. And technology will decentralize stuff far beyond the, busy, uh, far beyond the possibility of keeping it under control. I think we had a, a very nice example here yesterday. The, the Czech finance minister visited Parallel Polis to learn about uh, Bitcoin, and it really takes a rhetoric genius like Andreas Antonopoulos to make that guy understand just some little bit. Um, so, <clears throat> um, decentralization is uh, the key word here. And um, I want to, as you, as you saw in the title of my talk, I compare Bitcoin to gold. So this is the part for people who don't know much about Bitcoin. So if you're into Bitcoin, bear with me for a couple of minutes. I'm trying to get it, uh, the others on board. Um, it, it is about sound and honest money, um, of which we only have two kinds so far. One kind is precious metals and the other kind um, is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the very new kind and um, this is the reason why, for example, um, people from the so-called Austrian School of Economics um, <clears throat> demand our financial systems actually to go back to a, a, a gold-backed monetary standard. Um, <clears throat> so, um, what do gold and Bitcoin have in common? Am I making this up or um, are there actually clues that we can find in Bitcoin uh, to give us uh, or yeah, to convince us of that? Besides the fact that you may or may not know that Bitcoin has a limited amount of currency units that can ever be um, found or produced, um, that is the case, and it's the same case with gold. There are only so and so many bitcoins possible mathematically, according to the algorithm, on the planet or in the universe. Uh, just like there is only so and so many gold atoms available on this planet. Another um, parallel is even the, the way we, even the word bitcoin mining, of which you may have heard, uh, contrary to common belief, Bitcoin mining is not something that allows you to produce Bitcoin, but it's the same as with gold. Um, Bitcoin mining means to discover the Bitcoins that are actually already in existence. Um, also, Satoshi in uh, he, or the the online identity of Satoshi Nakamoto, we don't know who that was or how many people there were, um, gave us some hints here, for example, the Satoshi Nakamoto profile on the Peer to Peer Foundation has a birthday, which is the 5th of April 1975. And um, <clears throat> To anyone who's into sound money and Austrian economics, um, those, that, that date actually means something because 
Um, on the 5th of April in 19, I believe it was 33, um, President Roosevelt prohibited the American people from owning gold uh, coins and gold bullion. And in 1975, President Ford lifted that ban again. <clears throat> so, I want to read something I wrote down here actually for another presentation that compares those both um, kinds of money, uh, precious metals and Bitcoin, to explain what they have in common. That's basically three very important things. Both precious, metal, pre precious metals and Bitcoin are bearer assets, meaning they come without a counterparty risk. They are not anybody's liability nobody's IOU, and there is no need to trust anyone. That means you hold an ounce of gold in your hand, you own an ounce of gold. You hold the private keys to your Bitcoin, you own these Bitcoin, period. Um, and if you wish so, nobody even has to know that you have it. Second of all, um, they are both not political, not even democratic. They cannot be inflated by any king or president, nor by the people's vote for that matter. Nobody's will changes the amount of gold atoms on the planet or the amount of bitcoins on the blockchain. And um, third of all, they, came with their, they come with their own payment mechanism or payment network. That means if you hand me an ounce of gold or send me a bitcoin, I can instantly verify the payment. I know I have been paid without having to ask anyone else. And because of there is no middleman involved, I know that this payment is irreversible and cannot be confiscated by anyone. That nobody can charge me negative interest rates on my money or bail my money into some bankrupt bank. And neither an ounce of gold nor a bitcoin needs anyone's permission to change, to change hands or neither of them tells any regulator that value has been transferred. Um, this is because they both are decentralized and they are the only decentralized monies we have. Um, <clears throat> it is quite important at this point also to understand that the idea of digital cash is not anything that came into the world with Bitcoin. Um, the idea of digital cash is actually 25, more than 25 years old. So in the late 80s, early 90s of the last century, a group called the Cypherpunks, and there is actually one of these gentlemen here on, uh, Mr. Mr. May is here on um, this conference and is holding a talk. He's not in the audience, is he? No. Um, so this group of uh, people calling themselves the cypherpunks, what we call this nowadays crypto anarchists, or if we don't want to scare someone away, we call ourselves um, crypto economists, um, already back then had the vision that at some stage in the future, when bandwidth and computing power keep growing the way they grew back then, um, do hold the potential to, ent to entirely change our hierarchically organized world. Um, th this goes far beyond money, but, uh, as you may have realized by now. So there's a hell of a lot of um, stuff going on in regards to free trade, to, to finding consensus and so on. But I want to talk about um, this digital cash that was the idea there, um, because digital cash um, is exactly what we need in this world to allow the free trade, free and peaceful trade between parties without interference um, of any regulatory or government bodies. And um, so when you, when you hear, for example, experts telling you that, well, Bitcoin is the first of its kind and the first of its kind is never the one that actually uh, makes it through to mass adoption and so on, like usually you get the example of a web browser, then you can tell them that they're wrong because Bitcoin is, as far as I'm concerned, uh, we had like 200 or 250 digital cash projects before Bitcoin actually happened. They all failed either because of technical reasons, or if they 
achieved um, technological success and actually worked, in the end they failed uh, due to regulatory reasons because as soon as you create uh, money outside of the state monetary system, um, the state and the banks and the financial re uh, regulator regulatory bodies um, will uh, with no doubt come along and shut that stuff down. <clears throat> so. Uh, the other day, uh, um, I was on a on a on a panel at the, at uh, in Berlin Mitte, speaking there, being invited by some government people about, and the question was, are we in the future going to pay with cash? Because the, uh, to abandon cash is a is a real big topic amongst um, politicians and finance ministers and so on. Are we in the future going to pay with cash or with something like Bitcoin? And even there, I have to explain that Bitcoin is cash. The difference between cash and uh, another form of money is not that the one is physical and you can hold it in your hand and the other is somehow something digital in a database or on a computer. The difference between cash um, is that I can pay this money person to person without using a middleman. Um, the difference is that when a payment has been made, it is finalized. Nobody can take it back. Like at our bar, somebody puts 10 euros on the bar and I have it. I don't need a middleman to take that cash. And also I know that if that person does not draw a gun, they cannot reverse the, pay the, um, the payment. <clears throat> um, so, with Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto actually turned that vision of the cypherpunks into reality. And uh, he did not only do that, um, he gave the digital cash the properties of gold, as I've just tried to, um, to explain. And with that, gave us this entirely new digital money um, without the possibility of monetary oppression, that's like with cash, monetar monetary oppression means that somebody somewhere can decide what you can do with your money. So, uh, for example, with euros or dollars via PayPal, MasterCard, Visa and your bank account, you can actually send a donation to Ku Klux Klan, but you cannot send a donation to WikiLeaks, which is due to political reasons. Um, a money without any possibility of political abuse, um, mainly meaning the inflation of the monetary base, which uh, devalues the savings and the money of everybody who has that kind of money. And um, also very important, um, allowing permissionless innovation. So, uh, meaning everybody can take Bitcoin, everybody can change, um, Clients can produce, can, can, can build new applications anywhere on the world and they do not need permission. The only thing they need is to, to create a product that is valuable for other people and everybody can use it. So the permissionlessness of Bitcoin is not only in the use but also um, in the innovation sector. Right. As I mentioned before, this is entirely only possible because Bitcoin is decentralized. And um, <clears throat> you may or may not have heard about uh, the big discussion in the Bitcoin community about the scaling of the blocks of which the Bitcoin blockchain is made up. And funnily enough, what we hear there is, okay, we have people who say, the blocks should be small, like at the moment they are one megabyte. I'm not going to uh, try to explain blocks, you know, in, in case I, ha uh, other than if I have to. <laughs> um, so you have people who say the blocks are small and small is beautiful and they should, should stay there because if we make them bigger, we are uh, uh, running into the problem of more centralization. And funnily enough, on the other hand, you have people who say the blocks need to, be, need to get bigger um, because if they stay small, um, we're running the risk of running into um, higher centralization. So as I said, I, as I'm not a technician, 
and I cannot really uh, evaluate these statements from a technological point of view. Um, I try to make up my mind and find metaphors to tell me which is actually the way that we need to go to stay decentralized. And <clears throat> doing so, I actually came to the conclusion that in order to stay decentralized, um, we don't need one megabyte blocks or two megabyte blocks. Actually, we should have a negative block size. And I'm going to try to explain that negative block size now with this beautiful old analog technology, which was uh, very quickly and spontaneously um, <laughs> improvised here by the organizers. Um, to explain that whole thing. So decentralization, what does decentralization mean? This is also already a problem because there is no such thing as centralized and decentralized. There's a hell of a lot of gray shades in between. Um, so uh, I was trying to think, um, what is the absolute ideal of decentralization? And the absolute ideal of a decentralized network is a pure peer-to-peer -peer network. That means a network that is made up of nodes um, who are all equal. <clears throat> um, so that means the easier it is for every participant in this network to run a node. Um, the more decentralized we are, the difference here is, um, again, as I said before, oh, this looks beautiful, thank you. I'll try. Um, the difference here really is, um, can I find the truth out for myself? The truth meaning, has a payment been made and is it irreversible now? Can I find that out myself or do I have do I have to ask anyone else if that payment has been made? Um, which leads me to the conclusion that if we had an ideal peer-to-peer -peer payment network, that would actually mean that every person on the planet, in any environment, can at any moment, and in no time, and at no expense, find the truth out for themselves. Um, <clears throat> so, Running a Bitcoin node, which is what you need to find the truth out for yourself, does cost you some resources. You need, a, you need computing power, you need bandwidth, you need storage space. The Bitcoin blockchain actually by now is something nearing 100 gigabyte or, or 120. I don't, I'm not sure exactly. Um, but ever, whoever tells me that the block size is not a problem, uh, I'm saying, well, you haven't used it because handling it really sucks. Um, so, dealing with this blockchain and finding out the truth for myself has some cost and it was actually uh, Paul Stortz who came up with a certain term that I want to use here now and that term is CONOP. Does this function? Oh, it functions beautifully. The term is CONOP and CONOP stands for Cost of Node Operation. As I said, um, the higher the cost of node operation is, the less likely people are to run their own node to find out the truth for themselves. If, code, if this code, uh, cost of node operation would be ideal, it would be zero. So um, that means it doesn't cost me anything to find the truth out for myself, so there is no problem doing so instead of asking someone else um, for this truth. Obviously, cost of node operation is not zero because you need computing power bandwidth and storage. Um, so what does the cost of node operation depend upon? Um, I'm, I'm uh, making up this other axis here now because um, we can clearly say that we now have a, mega, um, have a block size of one megabyte and that leads to some cost of node operation. Now, I say a block size of one megabyte creates a cost of node operation of one. The point here to understand is that this CONOP of one cannot be interpreted in dollars or euros or anything like that because it is different to anyone else on the planet. Maybe you're sitting at home at some 
really huge fiber optic internet connection and you have all this computing power um, that you don't need unless you're you're playing doom and you have lots of excess, excess storage so in that case cost of node operation for you is really negligible you don't care but it's very different if you're somewhere in the desert of kenya or uh, is there actually desert in kenya or in the jungle in kenya um, and have a have a mobile phone with no computing power and no storage space and so on and so on and so on so we all we can say is that a, a block size of one megabyte creates a conop of one which is subject to your individual environment. Another thing that we can say is if we increase the block size to two megabytes, there is no doubt for me that we increase the conop to two, which is a higher conop, which is a higher cost of finding out the truth for myself. <clears throat> and I believe um, we can create this thing here and say the higher the block size is, the higher the cost of node operation is and the more difficult it is for anyone to find the truth out for themselves, find out if they have been paid or not. Now there is actually a uh, discussion going on, is, is that linear or is that not linear, is that um, exponential or anything like that and I'm saying it does not matter because the only thing that matters is indeed if we have a higher block size, we have a higher conop. Um, <clears throat> so I'm like, okay, this looks like beautiful. Um, it already tells me that the smaller the block size is, the, um, the lower the cost of node operation is. And um, here's one other thing. Whoever you ask who understands Bitcoin, if there is one actual design flaw in the whole system, you will very probably get the same answer from all of these people, and that is to say, yeah, we have forgotten, or Satoshi have forgotten, to put an incentive in there to run, an own, to run your own node. Um, something like <clears throat> a reward for node operation, um, which is kind of like the counterpart of cost of node operation. So obviously, already looking at this, um, I realize, wow, if I want to go down there, obviously, the best thing I can do is create a negative block size. If I want to get into this territory down here, I need a negative block size um, to create some kind of reward for node operation. Now, unfortunately, we live in a world <clears throat> with only three space and one time dimension. We live in a world where um, the laws of thermodynamics cannot be overcome. So obviously, it is pretty impossible to create a negative file size in the physical world. So I'm like, okay, forget that. But then I realized, wow, in that same world, um, it is actually totally impossible to create a negative gravity. But nevertheless, humankind made it to a point where we can make 100 tons of metal behave as if they were living in another universe, we're existing in another universe where there is a possibility of negative gravity and we did that by taking the right metal, by giving it the right structure to be really strong um, and by giving it the right shape and by attaching things to it like wings and propulsion systems. All of a sudden you have a hundred tons of metal and they fly. It's like negative gravity. So the issue we need to solve here to get to, I'd say, minus one or minus two reward, um, um, cost of node operation, which takes us, gives us a reward to do so, is to find things um, yeah, that, that give Bitcoin wings and propulsion systems and so on. Um, we can obviously only find these things down here because um, what we have up here is actually what I call 
Bankland. Yes. Um, what do I mean by that? The further we go up here, the, the, um, the more people cannot find the truth out for themselves, but need to ask someone else for that truth. That someone else, obviously, is some kind of service provider who tells you if you have been paid. And we can take a look at some companies and people who um, are really stressing the whole discussion about increasing the block size. Um, there is, for example, um, companies like Coinbase, who um, their CEO is one of the loudest voices in the whole sphere saying, we need bigger blocks, we need bigger blocks. Now, funnily enough, Coinbase is a company uh, with a lot of VC money, and their goal is to be your service provider, to be able to tell you the truth so you don't have to find it out yourself. Um, we have other companies up here, like Circle, um, pro uh, proposing an, uh, an, an increase of the block size, and we have the same thing here. Um, it's a company that wants you to leave it up to them to find the truth out for you. We also have blockchain.info up here. <clears throat> the company of Bitcoin Jesus, Roger Ver, um, who is the utmost loudest voice um, proposing um, bigger blocks. And yes, blockchain.info is a company that wants to find out the truth for you, wants to tell you if, if you have been paid, and wants to um, make payments for you and receive payments for you. So up there is the area that I call Bankland. Um, and on the other side of this whole um, structure here, that's basically you and me, and Alice, and Bob, and all the other guys who want to find the truth out for themselves. Um, so, yeah, anyhow, this is, this is um, as I said, any technician will roll their eyes and go like, this is beautiful, um, but thermodynamics, time and space dimensions, and so on. But as I said, um, for me personally, this makes absolutely and entirely clear where the direction should be that we are going into. The further we go up this way, the deeper we go into bank land, the, um, the less possibility we have to find out our stuff for ourselves. And the further we go down here, um, the easier it is for all of us to just use Bitcoin as a peer-to-peer -peer currency. Um, and we already can see um, in the Bitcoin development um, stuff that can actually somehow take us there. Stuff <clears throat> that gives us a reward to running a node. For example, what we can find down here is the Lightning Network, um, which, is, which is an overlay on the Bitcoin network that allows people um, to exchange money peer-to-peer, -to, -peer, um, to route money over that network. Um, <clears throat> and it does so by um, rolling out so-called payment channels now, in order to run a payment channel um, or a payment channel node, here is one thing. It is a very good idea to run an own and full Bitcoin node as well. We also know that the people running, who will be running um, payment channels will ask for a small fee uh, if you route your payment over their channel. Um, you have to imagine that somebody running a Lightning Network channel and running a Light Lightning Network node has to put some Bitcoin in there that can be exchanged in this, um, in this, in this Lightning channel. So we are getting already with the Lightning Network to a point where I can take my Bitcoin that I have at home, um, deploy them to a Lightning channel, run a Lightning node, and make some fees with it, which is actually an incredible feature for the future because it 
allows us some th to do something like a bank savings account that pays you a little interest. We are, we are moving with fiat money into the area of negative interest rates, which is already great for Bitcoin because in a world where there's negative interest rates on fiat money, um, zero interest on Bitcoin is more than the negative interest on your bank account. And if we manage to get to this lightning uh, network environment where I can deploy my Bitcoin to collect some fees without doing something for it, we actually get positive um, interest on Bitcoin. And here we already have a reward of node operation. We are finding other stuff here on that side, um, on, in, in this corner of the graph, oops, like side chains, which are also um, a technology that allows us to do other things with Bitcoin than sending money around, but not only that, we can also um, make some money over here on that side. So, however, um, <clears throat> as I said, I'm drawing this graph to kind of make clear what the direction should be, um, <clears throat> but um, it would be unfair of me to not at least take the two major arguments against um, smaller blocks into account. And I want to take two very famous and popular people um, who said something in this regard and counter their argument. One is Roger Ver, Bitcoin Jesus. He gave an interview the other day and told uh, the interviewer, if scaling Bitcoin quickly means there is a risk of Bitcoin becoming PayPal 2.0, I think that risk is worth taking because we will always be able to make Bitcoin 3.0 that has the properties that we want. Um, but I think we only have one really good shot at having Bitcoin become the default platform for people to transact on across the world and so on and so on. So um, we need to make sure we scale fast enough to allow these new people to come onto Bitcoin, even if it means risking some decentralization or risking it becoming, like I said, PayPal 2.0. Um, there are some major flaws with this argument. One of them is if we have a centralized network, we will never be able to build any decentralized thing on that. If we keep Bitcoin decentralized, everybody can put a centralized layer on it and everybody else can be free to use the centralized layer or keep on using the decentralized stuff. Also, one flaw with this thought is that mass adoption of Bitcoin is not imminent. You will hear the argument that um, mass adoption of Bitcoin would already have happened if the block size was big enough that everybody can use Bitcoin. Uh, to be honest, yes, we right now have a limited amount of um, transactions that can be done over Bitcoin, but it's not at all like, wow, there's six billion people out there who would love to make transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain, but we don't have space for them. There's no six billion people out there who want to use Bitcoin right now because People, um, this is not like a photo sharing app for a mobile phone or anything like that, that everybody can just install and use. We are talking here about a monetary system. We are talking about um, the trust that people have into money. And people don't understand Bitcoin and people therefore don't go like, wow, I've just read an article about this cool new money and I'm going to exchange all my dollars and euros now into Bitcoin. That's not going to happen. I tell you what is going to drive mass adoption of Bitcoin and that's banks and governments themselves. Because only when people get really burnt in the fiat money world, they will start looking for alternatives. Only when people in Cyprus and Greece get their money bailed into the bank um, and get capital controls inflicted on them and they see someone or hear of someone who has been using Bitcoin instead of Euro, they realize, wow, um, there is actually something to that new money um, that gives it an advantage over the current system. So <clears throat> there is actually one other big argument that um, people who propose big blocks um, 
always put on the table and this is probably a bit of a heresy now because that argument actually comes from Satoshi Nakamoto himself. And I want to read this. Um, this is on the Bitcoin Talk forum. He wrote this something like eight years ago when somebody already talked about the scaling issue and was like, right, okay, but there's only this and that many amounts, uh, this and that many transactions possible in this network. And Satoshi wrote, the current system where every user is a network node is not the intended configuration for large scale. That would be like every Usenet user runs their own NNTP server. The design supports letting users just be users. The more burden it is to run a node, the fewer nodes there will be. Those few nodes will be big server farms. The rest will be client nodes that only do transactions and don't generate. Um, so, I really, really think that Satoshi Nakamoto, if it was one person or if it was a group of person, I have no doubt he, she or they are absolutely brilliant. <clears throat> so I'm looking at this and I go like, shit. So uh, <laughs> this genius actually tells me the same thing as Roger Ver does. And then I read it again and then I realize, no, I don't know how many people of you have ever used the Usenet and actually know what an NNTP server is. There's actually some hands there in the back, wow. So for all the others, let me explain. Usenet is, um, was from the early days of the internet. That this was before web browsers existed. This was before the World Wide Web. And uh, the Usenet is actually a huge message board, a uh, bit similar to today's forums, but just a global one. Um, and the argument Satoshi brings here, <clears throat> even though he turns it around, is actually the argument against big blocks. Because wonder why you are not using the Usenet, wonder why nobody is using the Usenet anymore, because it's especially exactly of the reason that he says here. That would be like every Usenet user runs their own NNTP server. They couldn't. In the early days, universities ran NNTP servers, and it was up to the university to decide which topics they would deliver on their news groups. Universities at some stage stopped um, um, delivering Usenet news groups and private corporations took over. So the only way nowadays, is still people using the Usenet, but the only way nowadays to use, the use, to, to use Usenet um, is to pay, and it's not cheap, uh, some service provider to deliver you these news and then it's also up to this service provider what news they deliver. So this is entirely a non-peer-to-peer -peer decentralized world. This argument um, describes exactly what happens um, if you leave the peer-to-peer -peer ideal <clears throat> and um, so just just to, to, to um, finish this no, I think I said I actually, um, I actually, I actually leave it with this uh, little little heresy about uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. I don't know. Um, I, w I made up my mind really. I was I was thinking about this. Uh, what is this nonsense? Because as I said, I really think she, he, or they are absolutely brilliant. Um, there's different explanations for that. I think if it was a group, maybe someone started this mail out of this group and another person of this group um, wrote the rest of the mail, uh, the forums post, and did not, um, did not actually read what the other member of Satoshi wrote. Um, maybe Satoshi was drunk at some stage, or maybe Satoshi was also confused at some stage. However, um, when I read his white paper, um, I do not even find the word centralized or decentralized in that paper. What I find is the term peer-to-peer, -peer, and that's six times on 12 pages. So I rather tend to uh, take the whole peer-to-peer -peer ideal as the goal where we should go to. And um, 
with this idea of the negative block size, I know that here we are peer-to-peer -peer, and here we are NNTP, Usenet and end up in Bankland. Thanks for listening.